No matter what else is happening in the world. There is always good news today. Welcome to Good News Today, the program where you will always find good news, no matter what else is happening in the world. I'm Jim Dearman, your host for Good News Today. Thanks so much for being with us. As always, I want to tell you what's coming your way on this edition of our program. We begin with our devotional time, as always, consisting of our scripture reading, beautiful singing, and a brief study of our scripture. And today we go to the Psalms, to a short but very powerful psalm on the subject of unity, a very important subject. Psalm 133, those three verses will be our reading. So we encourage you to get your Bibles opened to Psalm 133 and be ready to read along and to study along as a part of our devotional time. And following our devotional time, Roger Campbell joins us today for another Be Ready Always. And here's the, here's the issue with which he will deal today. Why did those who saw Lazarus raised from the dead not follow Jesus. Why did those who saw Lazarus raised from the dead not follow Jesus? This is an important study, and you will not want to miss that. And then Freddie Clayton comes along today with another walking and talking in the light. And this one is entitled, Saving Face But Losing Soul. Saving Face But Losing Soul. And you will not want to miss that. And then our final segment, our GNT Q and A, and the question with which we deal today: What is the doctrine of transferred righteousness? What is the doctrine of transferred righteousness? It's a false doctrine. I can tell you that, and we'll prove it from the Word of God in that final segment. Again, we thank you for joining us, and we hope you're ready to read along and study along with us from this brief but powerful psalm, the 133, 133rd Psalm, attributed to David. And it begins, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments, it is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. back for the study portion of our devotional time, looking today at the 133rd Psalm. Just three verses, but power, powerful verses, and verses that pertain to an extremely crucial subject, and that subject is unity. As we said, this psalm is attributed to, to David, and it begins, Behold. In other words, 
take notice, <laughs> take good notice of just how good and how pleasant something is. What is that something? For brethren to dwell together in unity. Now, we'll make some application to the brethren context today, but of course, in, in the time of the psalmist, he's talking about brother Israelites, those who uh, were followers of God, and it still applies to followers of God, but brethren has a little different, has a, a different context today for us because those who are brethren are those who are in Christ. This psalm was obviously written at a time before Christ, but in Israel there was to be this unity, and that's what God intended for His people to enjoy and to have. How good it is, how profitable it is. And then he says, and how pleasant. The idea of the word pleasant here is to be attractive, something that is, uh, it brings delight. It is something that we should treasure in the Lord's church today. And we'll talk more about that um, in just a few moments. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And of course, the Bible has a great deal to say about unity from Old Testament, as in this passage, to the New Testament, a passage that we'll look at uh, that'll demonstrate that uh, in just a few moments. But notice the, uh, the illustration then that follows the statement of how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. He goes on, it is like the precious oil upon the head. Whose head? Well, this is Aaron. The, the anointing of the high priest is alluded to here by the psalmist. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron. And this was a part, this anointing with the oil of the, of the high priest Aaron, it was a part of the sanctification process by which he was sanctified to be that mediator, that high priest who would, who would uh, make atonement uh, for his own sins and for the sins of the people on the day of atonement, etc., and all of the sacrifices that were involved in the priesthood and everything that that involved under the old covenant. But the anointing process was a part of his being set apart for this uh, very high, the highest office, this mediatorial office uh, of the priesthood. But then he goes on, well, he talks about it running down on the edge of his garments. In other words, the idea here is the, the complete, the complete unity, the peace that comes, the joy that comes from this unity that, that engulfs uh, uh, this body of brethren here. And of course, in our case, the brethren who are our brothers and sisters in, in Christ. And that's the illusion here is that there is to be that complete unity. It, it covers the body. And of course, the spiritual application is that unity is to cover the body of Christ, the spiritual body of Christ, which is today the church of Christ. And then another illustration uh, verse 3, it is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. Now, Zion, of course, uh, was a Mount Zion where obviously the temple was there, where God's presence was ultimately once the temple was, uh, was built, Solomon's temple initially. Uh, before that, the tabernacle, and God met with His people there, as it were, uh, de descending upon the mountains of Zion. But the idea of dew is an interesting and very, uh, very beautiful uh, description of, of unity. Dew is something that is pleasant. It has the connotation of, of calming, of being a, a quiet presence as the dew descends upon uh, the ground. It has the connotation of being refreshing. And that's the, that's the idea of the kind of unity about which the psalmist writes, the kind of unity that God desires for His people in every age that it be that refreshing unity because we are of one mind. We are of the same judgment. And so it descends upon the mountains of Zion, and of course the application to us today would be the unity in the church because Zion today would be spiritual Zion, the spiritual Jerusalem, not the literal Jerusalem, but the spiritual or heavenly Jerusalem, which of course 
is the church. He goes on in concluding this beautiful, brief, but powerful psalm, for there the Lord commanded the blessing. That's where God's presence dwelt in literal Zion under the old covenant. But what was that blessing? Life forevermore. And today the application for us is life forevermore. Eternal life is found in spiritual Zion, in the church, in Christ. And to be in Christ is to be in the church. And to be in the church is to be in Christ because they are one and the same. Now I want to go back to this figure of uh, the illustration of Aaron and bring in something here that, uh, that I uh, have found from the late Franklin Camp, great gospel preacher and a wonderful Bible uh, student who spent hour after hour, day after day in the study of God's Word. And in his comments on the Psalms, and specifically a comment on Psalm 133, he makes some points here that I think are, are very, very important to us about this matter of unity. Here's what he ha has said. He says, verse 2 here, the idea of Aaron and the anointing of the oil he's talking about. Verse 2 calls attention to the importance of holiness. Because remember we said Aaron, this anointing of oil was to set him apart for this holy use. And so sanctification or holiness here. Here's what Brother Camp says. Aaron was selected as high priest. And this is a reference to his consecration setting apart in order that he might mediate between the nation and God, showing, and this is the important point he makes, showing that holiness is necessary for unity. Holiness is necessary for unity. He goes on, sometimes we fail to realize this fact. We give emphasis to doctrinal purity, but doctrinal purity apart from holiness will not bring about unity. And he goes on, he says, while we have emphasized the importance of doctrinal truth, the importance of the correct name, the organization, the plan of salvation, and all these things, which he says are truly correct, and they're important, obviously, that is only half of it. Those who believe these things about the organization of the church, the name, etc., that everything be according to the pattern, in other words here, those who believe these things must also see the impact and feel the imprint of that upon their lives. He goes on, unholy attitudes and dispositions can bring about division, as will false teachers. So it's not just false teachers and false teaching, but unholy attitudes and dispositions in the church can bring about disunity and division. It's a very important point that he makes. Then he goes on, in Ephesians 4, before Paul discusses the seven ones, those seven ones of unity, he mentions attitudes of heart in order that there might be the bond of peace. And he says this psalm, Psalm 133, is a reminder of the importance of holiness in relationship to unity. Now with that in mind, go to Ephesians 4 with me here, and you'll see what the late Brother Kent was, was talking about. I therefore, this is verse 1 of Ephesians 4, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to have a walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Here's verse 2. With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. These are these attitudes about which Brother Kemp spoke that are important, absolutely essential to unity. Then Verse 4 begins, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. You see the attitudes that must be there if unity is to be maintained. The late Brother Camp makes some excellent points in that regard. Well, that's all the time we have for our devotional time. Time to join uh, Roger Campbell for an excellent Be Ready Always segment. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 that Christians are to be ready to give a defense or to give an answer. Here's a question that, that we sometimes encounter. We read in, in the book of John chapter 11 that Jesus raised his good friend Lazarus from the dead. Now what's interesting is 
After he raised Lazarus from the dead and some of the Jews went and told the Jewish leaders, they made a confession. According to John 11 and verse 47, those Jewish leaders said, this man, meaning Jesus, this man does many miracles. And then they basically asked, what are we going to do? Isn't that fascinating? They admitted not only that Jesus did a real miracle in the case of Lazarus, they said this man does many miracles. But our question is, well, if they're willing to confess those miracles, why wouldn't they choose to follow him? In general, the Bible says this, Jesus came unto his own, but his own received him not. John chapter 1 and verse number 11. What that means is Jesus, as a Jew, came to his own people. And some of the Jews accepted him and became his followers. But the overwhelming majority, they rejected him. Again, among those who saw the miracles and confessed those miracles, why would they not choose to follow him? Well, I think in the book of John, we have some indicators, some information that helps us see what was holding some people back. For example, in John chapter 5, as Jesus spoke to an audience, we read in verse 42, But I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. And so for some people, what held them back from choosing to follow Jesus was a lack of love for the God of heaven. Well, in John chapter 9, we read about Jesus doing a different miracle. In John 9, the miracle there is the healing of a blind man. And after Jesus did that healing, the Jewish leaders came and spoke to the parents of that man who had been blind. And as those parents of that man responded to the inquiries, the Bible says this in John 9 and verse 22. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. And so there was an element of fear in the Jewish society because the Jewish leaders had put out the word, look, if anybody confesses Jesus as the Messiah, they're gone from the synagogues. In fact, you remember what we read in John 12? Among the chief rulers, among the leadership of the Jews, there were many who believed on Jesus. That's what the Bible says in John 12 in verse 42. But even though they believed on him, there's something they were not willing to do. Remember what that was? They were not willing to confess him. Why? Number one, they didn't want to be cast out of the synagogues. And number two, they loved the praises of men more than the praise of God. So as we think about among the Jewish leaders in particular, here were individuals who confessed the miracles of Jesus, but they were not ready to be committed followers. What did we learn in John 5, 22? With some, they didn't have the love of God in their hearts. With some, it was a matter of fear. With some, it was a matter of loving the praises of men more than the praises of God. It really boiled down to the heart, didn't it? You know, Jesus also had a very high expectation for those who were going to be his disciples. Jesus said, if any man will, that is, if any man desires to come after me, let him do what? Let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke 9 and verse 23, that's a high expectation. Or as we read in Luke 14 and verse 33, if one's not willing to forsake all that he has, he cannot be the disciple of Jesus. You know what? In our time, we encounter some of the same things. Individuals see the truth. They learn the truth. They confess the truth. 
but they're not ready to become devoted followers of Jesus. And it all boils down to they don't have the faith or the courage to make that choice. God calls us to follow His Son, Jesus, for His glory and for our salvation. That's what we need to do. I'm Roger Campbell, and this has been Be Ready Always. Our thanks to our uh, Roger Campbell, our good friend and brother in Christ, for an excellent Be Ready Always segment. You know, demonstrates that even seeing, even seeing miracles, if the heart is not right, then one will not change. Well, we have all those miracles recorded for us. And if the heart is right, we don't need to see miracles performed because they're not being performed because they serve their purpose. And Roger has, uh, has dealt with this subject in a very effective way, as he always does. And Freddie Clayton is always effective with his walking and talking in the light. And that's coming up after a brief but important information break. We'll be right back. You may have questions or comments about Good News Today. We'd like to hear from you. Or if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee 37327. That's Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee 37327. You may prefer to email us at goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. That's goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. Or call us toll free at 1-877-384-7221. That's 1-877-384-7221. We'd like to hear from you. Hearing from our viewers is always good news to us. Please take advantage of our contact information. We'd like to hear from you. Also, you can um, hear our content 24-7 at truth.fm. And as we've mentioned before, truth.fm is an organization that works with Churches of Christ to help them set up an internet radio station, as Good News Today has done, to evangelize their local community. And so you can contact them for more information, info at truth.fm, or visit their website at truth.fm. For more information, that's truth.fm. And don't forget to download our smartphone app, smart device app, and you can see a segment or our entire program and visit our website at gnttv.org and we'd love to have you enroll in our Bible correspondence course as hundreds have done. Right now it's time for Freddie Clayton walking and talking in the light. Have you ever heard of someone trying to save face? Sometimes there is an attempt made by individuals or by groups to preserve their position in the eyes of their fellow man with its associated honor and prestige. Saving face is a figure of speech for doing just that. Sadly, when dishonest means are employed to save face with the treasured prestige, position, and honor of such persons or groups in jeopardy, such is sinful. The souls of the fraudulent will be lost due to their sinful deceitfulness. Their priority is not in pleasing God, but pleasing man. Think of some warnings about this very thing. Paul asked the question in Galatians chapter 1 at verse 10, For do I now persuade man or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Men pleasers may hold powerful positions due to their desire. They may even employ others to shout down anyone who would dare question the choices or the character of the men pleaser. However, when a choice is to be made between pleasing men or God, that man, pleaser, is making a soul-damning choice, obviously. There may be hundreds at their funeral, but God knows better, and so can we. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, at verse 4, Paul wrote, But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who test our hearts. The fact is, many are more concerned with how other people think about them than how God views them. This is eternally deadly. Those who want to be considered higher 
than their sinful condition will allow them, often attempt everything possible to cover themselves from the reality of their sins. They may even attack the very ones attempting to assist them in this dilemma. How could this religious or this ridiculous situation arise? It's relatively simple. Some had rather attempt to save face than admit and turn from sin in order to save their soul. It is a matter of choice. Which choice, friends, have you made? This is Freddie Clayton, walking and talking in the light. Our thanks again to Freddie Clayton. Coming up, it's our final segment, our G&T Q&A, after one more brief break. For our final segment, it's our G&T Q&A. The question we mentioned earlier, what is the doctrine of transferred righteousness? Well, as we said, it's a false doctrine. The doctrine of transferred righteousness is the allegation that Christ's own personal righteousness is transferred to the individual and belongs to the sinner. Well, that is false doctrine. It's not supported in Scripture. In fact, it's extremely dangerous because it encourages people to consider very lightly the commandments of the Lord. I mean, if they have the, the very righteousness of Christ, if that were the case, that his personal uh, righteousness were transferred, then all those in that category would be pure in Christ. And so their claim on heaven would be secured. It would no longer be a matter of grace, uh, but of uh, it would be a, of merit. They had earned it, uh, the transferred righteousness is theirs, the righteousness of Christ, and so the grace of Christ would be, would be negated. And God couldn't deny them entrance into heaven any more than He could deny His only begotten Son. It's clearly false doctrine. Our sins are forgiven. Look at Psalm 32, 1 and 2, quoted by Paul in Romans 4, 8. Thanks for being with us. Good news, good news, always good news. Good news, good news, there is good news today. All around the world, good news, good news, always good news. Good news, good news, there is good news today.